We need your forgiveness, Lord God, because we know that without forgiveness, God, we cannot make it into your kingdom. So forgive us, Lord God. And Father, we receive, Lord, I receive your forgiveness right now in Jesus' name, God. And I thank you, Father. And I give you glory, I give you honor, and I give you praise, Lord. If there's any sick on the line, I speak healing right now to their bodies in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, because you are a healer, Lord God. You are a deliverer, Lord. You are a sanctifier, Lord God. And Father, I just praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, God, just for who you are, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I give this Bible study over to you tonight, Lord God. Father, I ask that you would speak through me to your people, Lord God, to teach your people what you would have them to know, Lord God. And Father, I just thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, God, and I just praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. You're so worthy, God. You're so worthy, God. Hallelujah, God, you're so worthy, God, you're so worthy, God. Father, I just want to praise you, God, you're so worthy, you're so worthy, hallelujah. You are the almighty God, hallelujah. Welcome into this place, hallelujah. Welcome into this place, Lord. Welcome into this broken vessel, oh God. Welcome into our hearts, God. Father, take complete control of our minds, God. Father, we want to have the mind of Christ, hallelujah. God, I just thank you, Lord God. Father, prepare our hearts and minds to receive your engrafted word, God. Till up the soil of our heart, God, so that we can receive your word, God, because your word has the ability to deliver. Your word has the ability to make totally free. Your word has the ability to heal. Your word has the ability to sanctify and to make completely whole, Lord. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, for all that you've done, Father, and all that you're going to do, God. Because you alone are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah, God. You are worthy, God. And Father, for every person that's going to join in on the line, God. Father, I ask that you would touch their hearts and minds, Lord God. That they would come in and be with one accord with us, Lord God. As we dive into your word, Lord God. As we learn more about you, God. Because, Father, this is all about you, God. If you don't show up, God, none of this will matter, Lord. So, Father, we want you to show up. We need you to show up, God. We invite you to show up, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Father, encamp your angels round about those that fear you and that love you, Lord God. Keep us away from the evil one, Lord God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, God. Hallelujah. And your kingdom come to this earth, Lord God. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious name, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Words of Wisdom Bible Study. Glory to God. God is an awesome, awesome God. Hallelujah. Regardless of what we might be going through today, God is awesome. Hallelujah. God is a deliverer. God is a sanctifier. Hallelujah. God is able to make us totally free. Hallelujah. In the spirit of our minds, glory to God. Hallelujah. I thank you for writing my name in the land's book of life. Hallelujah. Because that gives us access to heaven. If your name is not written in the land's book of life, you will not be given access. And in order to have access, you must have repented of your sins and have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior before you close your eyes on this side. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Give me a moment. I'm just uh, reminding a few people that to come to jump on. I know sometimes people get busy during the course of the day and, and sometimes they tend to forget. Hallelujah. But as we go on, as we do always, I encourage you to get out your Bible whether it's your Android device, whether it's your iPad, your iPhone, your computer, hallelujah, whatever your love letter is on, I encourage you to get that out. And as you get out your love letter from your Heavenly Father, I encourage you to get out paper and pencil or paper and pen so that you can write down what the Spirit of the living God may say to you tonight. Because God is always speaking, but we're not always listening. So we're going to make sure that we tune our ears and our spirit in and be connected with 
the almighty God because he is almighty. He is powerful. He is loving. Hallelujah. And we want to be tuned into him, not just today, but always. Hallelujah. So as you get out your Bible and as you get out paper and pencil or paper and pen, we're going to make the declaration to ourselves, and we're going to make the declaration to the spiritual realm. Hallelujah. Because the power of life and death is in your tongue. So if you speak it, you will have it. Hallelujah. So we're going to make the declaration that this is my Bible. This is my love letter from my daddy. Hallelujah. This is my love letter. And it's personal. Tonight I have my paper Bible open. Hallelujah. This is my Bible. I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I pray that everyone has already got their Bibles out and Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to continue on next week by faith and to prayer. But this week, we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus being more than a carpenter. So I want you to get your Bibles out and turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. So as you're turning to Isaiah chapter 9 and you got your paper and pen or paper and, and pencil out, this week we have been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And on Sunday, we'll join together with other people of faith that may be in your church or in your congregation, and you're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even some people will do it on Saturdays. So on Saturday and Sunday, the preachers or the minister from the pulpit will be preaching, teaching, and discussing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're going to talk about Yeshua. They're going to talk about the Messiah. They're going to talk about Yahweh. These are all the names of Jesus and of God. These are all their names. It denotes their character. So they're going to discuss about the tomb being empty. They're going to discuss about those who arrived at the tomb and discovered it, that it was empty. They're going to talk about Mary Magdalene, who was delivered from the demons. They're going to talk about Mary, the mother of James and Hoseas. They're going to talk about the angel that descended from heaven and that rolled away the stone and that there was a big earthquake. They're going to talk about the soldiers that were there guarding the tomb and how afraid they became when they saw this angel coming down, rolling away the tomb. They're going to discuss these things. They're even going to discuss about Jesus when he rose from the grave and that when they looked inside, they saw the garments that the grave clothes that were on Jesus. They're going to discuss that they were neatly folded and put in the place where Jesus was. They even may discuss that when Jesus, because of the glory, when he was resurrected, because of his glory, it burnt an image in the garment that he had on. So they may even discuss some of those things. So as we dive into Isaiah chapter nine, for those who just joined in, we're going to Isaiah chapter nine. And I'm going to read a, a couple of verses, verses, and we're going to start with verse 6. And we're only going to do a couple of verses from this chapter. And I know that a lot of times when this particular, these particular verses are read, it's generally read at Christmas time when they discuss the birth of Jesus. So I'm reading from the New King James Version and Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And it says, for unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. So Isaiah chapter nine, for you who just joined in, um, we just read verses six and seven. So this Sunday or this Saturday, whichever day you go to church for your celebrate your Sabbath, Sabbath, few will discuss the fact that Jesus's birth, his life and death and resurrection were all planned before the world was created. See, the purpose of Jesus's birth was to die for humanity, to give us an escape route from eternal damnation. But who is Jesus? We know him by so many names, but who is he to you? So we're going to dive into these couple of verses and we're going to discuss some of the ways that we identify who Jesus is based on his characteristics, based on his personality, based on what he does in our life or what he's going to do in our life. So we know that whenever someone is named, whenever a person is called by a specific name, it is to identify that person. It is the reputation or what the person is expected to do in their lifetime. So when we look at the names of Jesus, Depending on which name you're using, it depends on how you are requesting him to act in your life. So when we look at verse 6, and it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government or the ruling political party or authority who has is a one who has power to make and enforce laws for a country or area shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace so for unto us a child is born in other words other words a child is born for us he was born for us he was purposely placed in the flesh he is the word of god he is the incarnate word of god god spoke his word and then he prepared flesh to put his word in and then he told the people that were uh the person that was to deliver jesus that was to birth the flesh of jesus he told them what specifically to call jesus to give this child a name. His name will be called Jesus. His name won't be called Joseph. His name won't be called Elijah. His name won't be called Billy or Bob. His name will be called Jesus. God is very specific and detailed. Whenever he tells us to do something, he is specific. You will never have to guess whether God is telling you to do something if you stay connected with him if you stay in his word, because see, he said his sheep know his voice and a stranger they will not follow. And the only way to know God is to know him by his word is to stay in close fellowship with him, to be so close to God that you can just smell him. You will be able to just feel his breath. You will be able to just be able to uh, just feel his very presence. So we've got to stay close to God. And then when you read in Matthew chapter one, it talks about the genealogy of Jesus and how the angel appeared to Joseph. And see, Joseph was going to put Mary away privately. He was going to divorce her because he saw that he knew that she was with child and he wasn't going to go through with that because he figured she must have been messing around. But God sent an angel to tell Joseph, the child that she's carrying, don't put her away, stay with her. He said, don't put her away because the child that is in her is done by the Holy Spirit. God moved upon her and God placed his seed within her. So the child that she's carrying is Jesus. His name is to be called Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is going to save the people from their sin. So the word of God was wrapped in flesh and the baby was named Jesus and he could have come. Jesus could have come as a grown man. He could have come fully grown. He could have came down just like that. But in order for him to experience the same things that you and I experience as humans, he had to come the same route that we took in order to get to earth. So he had to be birthed through a woman because God was doing everything in a strategic plan method so that we could see that we could also walk on this earth, that Jesus was without sin. And if we follow his footsteps, his direction, we too can live a life where we're not sinning like that. So 
Jesus even told us that unless we become as a little child, we can't enter the kingdom of God. See, when Jesus came and he was in the manger, that is the most, if you think of a baby, a baby is so helpless. It's, 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 it's cute, but then it's pitiful because it cannot do anything for itself. You've got to change it. You've got to burp it. You've got to feed it. You've got to bathe it. You've got to do everything for this child. So in order to come to God, we've got to be just like that little baby. We've got to be come in a helpless manner. We got to come, even though you may have some education, you've got to lay that education aside because that education means nothing when you're compared, when you're going up against God, because God is all knowing. He's been here before the world began and he'll be here after the world ends. He's eternal. He's all knowing. So we can't hold a candle up against God because he knows everything. So we've got to come to him as little children. So for unto us, a child is born. So Jesus is born. He was born. He was born to die. So as we be, as we come to him as little children and accepting him for who he is and not trying to make him or mold him into who we want him to be, but allow him to be who he is. Thank you, Lord. Philippians 2 says, 2 7 says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. See, when Jesus came in the flesh, he came as a person bound or tied or connected in service without wages. See, when he came, it wasn't, he wasn't expecting anything from us. He came to give his life and to serve us. He came to bring us back and to reconcile us back to God. Because see, when we all were born, it we were really born at a disadvantage because he said we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity or shaped in wickedness. So we didn't even stand a chance. So he said, since it's not fair that Adam transgressed and he fell and he broke our covenant, he broke our relationship. He says, I'm going to go down myself and I'm going to repair this relationship. He says, I'm going to redeem man unto myself. So that's why he says, for unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a child is born. So let me read you Philippians 2 from the NIV. It says, starting with verse 5, Philippians 2, starting with verse 5. And it says, in your relationship with one another, had the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus had the mindset that he came. He says, I come to do the will of my father. I come to everything my father says and does. He says, that's what I'm going to say. And that's what I'm going to do. Then in verse six, it says, who being in very nature of God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. When he was on earth, he did not use his his ability, his power for his own advantage. He knew what the plan was and he stuck to the plan. He knew everything he was supposed to do and he did not deviate from that. So for unto us, a, a child is given. He was given to us. He was given to us to reconcile us back to God. And then it says in verse seven, it says, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus was obedient. Everything that he did was strategically planned. Then in Luke chapter two, an angel, it tells us that an angel in verse nine, an angel of the Lord says, stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings. The angel says, I'm bringing you some good news of great joy, not just joy, but this is great joy. That means it goes beyond expectation, which will be to all people. That means that nobody has been left out. It's to all people. And then it tells us, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, the Messiah. So he said, the angel is declaring that this day, that on this day, the day that Jesus was born in the city of David, see, God is so specific. He told him exactly where Jesus will be born in the city of David. And he said, he is a savior. 
He is Christ the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is the one that the prophets have told you about would come. And then it goes, for you who just joined, we're Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, I'm expounding on. So then he says, unto us a son is given. That means he is freely given. It was a free transference from God. Jesus is a free gift. He's the free gift from God. God was showing us his heart. He was showing us who he is and that he loves, that he is love. He loves his creation so much. He said, I'm going to freely give you my son. God said, I'm giving you my very best. I'm giving you the best that I have. I'm going beyond 100%. I'm giving you the very best, the very best that I have. So he gave us Jesus. And he says he gave us his only begotten son, which means he fully gave him. He fully handed Jesus over, knowing that he was going to be crucified, knowing that the enemy was going to be gunning after him, knowing that he was going to be hated by so many people, knowing that they were going to whoop him, knowing that they were going to spit on him, knowing that they were going to create a whip that's made of glass and, and, and bone and metal, and that he was going to be whipped so bad to the point that his flesh was going to be ripped from the muscle and you, he would, you would be able to see his bones looking up at him because the muscle and everything was poured away from his bones. So God knew all these things were going to happen. Jesus knew all this was going to happen. But because of you and I, because he loves us so much, he said, I will take the pain. I will make the sacrifice. I will go and redeem them back to myself because that's how much I love them. So John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then it tells us in verse 17 of John chapter three, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. People look at this. He said he gave us his son and he gave it. He didn't give him to condemn us, but he gave it so that we would accept that free gift so that we can take, have the gift of eternal life. But you've got to take that free gift from God. You've got to accept it from him. And he said, he didn't send him into the world to condemn the world. But then he says, but that the world through him, through who? Through Jesus might be saved. So that's the reason why he gave us his son, his only begotten son. That's the reason why he gave us the best gift he had was his son. So he loves, God loves, God is love. He gave us the, he gave us Jesus, his only begotten son. And when you think about a son in a family, a son is important because in a family, the son is the one that takes on the legacy of the family name. Because most of the time when women get married, they change their name to whatever the, the man's name is. But when men get married, they generally keep their name. So it's important for the son to carry on the name. And the son is the image of his earthly father. So Jesus is the image of his father. That's why he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Because they kept asking Jesus, show us the father. Show us the father and it'll be sufficient for us. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So he's letting them know, I am, a, I am the split image of my father. I am the mirror image of my father. I am the exact replica of my father. My father and I are one. We look just alike. So he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So Jesus is the eternal son of God, and he is the second person of the Godhead. So Jesus came in the flesh, which means his flesh had a starting point. But Jesus, the son, the word of God, has no beginning and it has no end. Just the flesh that he was in had a starting point. So in the word, in the in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word is Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. So Jesus is fully God and he is fully man. So the word of God was wrapped in the flesh. And the flesh was named Jesus, and he came in the flesh. He was perfect. He came in the in a perfect body, which means that the body that Jesus came in, he came in the body that was the body like Adam and Eve had before they fell. So he had a perfect body. He had the body before fall of man. He came in. 
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. So in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, just write it down. We're still in Isaiah, but I'm trying to establish to you that why Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So Matthew 1, 21 says, and she, who is she? Mary. So, and Mary will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus was born to save us from our sin. Unto us, a son is given. A son is given to save us from our sin. He came to save his people from their sin. Then Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. What will be the sign, Lord? What sign did you give us so that we will know that the Messiah came, so that we will know Jesus came, so that we will know that Yahshua came? What is the sign? And he said, this is the sign Isaiah declared. He says, behold, the virgin who is Mary, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Why? would he be named Emmanuel? Because God gave him to us. Emmanuel means God with us. God says, I'm coming and I'm going to dwell among you. I'm going to come and redeem you back to myself. I'm going to come and walk the walk that you're walking, but I will be without sin so that I will have, I will be able to have even greater compassion on you because I'm going to be walking the same as you. I'm going to be walking in the same flesh, but yet I will not sin. Then in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, when he was being stoned, he gazed up in, in heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So when Jesus was resurrected, he got the glorified body that you and I, those who have received Jesus as the Lord and Savior, those who endure to the very end of your lifespan, we're the ones that will receive the glorified body. So he was able to see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And then we're told in 1 Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus came to also be a mediator for us. He is the go-between between us and God. He is the one that whenever you fall, whenever you sin, he'll go to God and he'll say, Father, forgive them. I'm, I'm still working with them. I'm still molding her. I'm still working with him. I'm still dealing with them. You know, I'm still working. So he's the one, he's our mediator between us and God. And he is a man, Christ Jesus. So it's letting us know that he came in the flesh and he has a glorified body. So he is not, a, he is not still in a spirit form. He is in the glorified body form. And he came to be a ransom for you and for me. And in order for him to be a ransom and to stand in your place and my place as sinful humans and to be a substitute for you and for me so that we don't get the punishment that we deserve. He had to walk in the flesh. He had to walk in human form and be without sin. And through his sinless nature, his sacrifice that he did on the cross, when he laid on the cross, it was a form of, uh, of an altar and his blood dripped down. That was the blood. That was the blood that he was pouring out as a ransom for you and a ransom for me. So think about that. Whenever you decide or think that you want to walk away from God, if you just think or do something that is sinful, think about Jesus on the cross and how when he was on the cross, all those hours and agony in the heat, and in pain and not able to breathe because every time he would try to take a breath up his it felt like his lungs and all was going to collapse and every time that he would try to raise himself up that the the nails and stuff that was in his hands and feet were creating even more excruciating pain think about when he was on the cross how his back was was just meat what was so raw and that when he would try to raise up that wood was scratching his back so think about what he sacrificed for you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for sacrificing for me. And then we go down to the next section, and it says in verse 6, Isaiah 9, verse 6, and it says, and the government will be upon his shoulder. So 
when Jesus was on the earth, they were expecting him to take over the government and go and sit in Jerusalem and, and kick out the government. They were expecting him to take over and to rule on this earth, but they did not understand that it was a futuristic event that was going to happen, that it was something that was going to happen in the future. But see, even now, if we allow Jesus to reign in us, we can see his kingdom come to this earth right now in our very lifetime because all we got to do is walk in his power and authority and allow him to instruct us on what to do. So we wait in expectation for it to be completely fulfilled. See, the government that we have, Jesus' government is totally different. The government that we have today that we know of, they are partial in their judgment. They show partiality based on your color, based on your social status, based on how much money you got, based on what school you went to. All laws don't apply to all people. Laws that pertain to certain people, they will be bent, they will be uh, done away with, they will turn their heads so that that person can get away with whatever it was that they've done. So all laws and rules don't govern everybody, but Jesus' government is not like that. Jesus does not show partiality. Jesus judges according to justice. He judges right. He judges according to righteousness. So when he rules as king, he is king. He also is a servant. Remember when we were reading in John and how he washed the feet of the disciples because he is a servant. He says, I come to serve. I come to serve you. I come to do for you. He wants to know what is it that you need me to do? He says, I will work, but who's going to let me work? He says, I want to do that, but you won't let me. You've got my hands tied. So the government will, will be upon his shoulders. So anything that you need, we are to give it over to Jesus. And his government, he's not going to, he's not the type of a king or ruler that is hungry after money. Everything belongs to Jesus anyway. But the government that we know of today will, will kill, cheat, and steal in order to get money, in order to keep the money, in order to make sure the money does not get in the wrong hands. But Jesus is not like that. He is a good king. He is a good ruler. He is a good leader. He is a great commander. He's an awesome commander. So Jesus says, I'm going to carry as the government is going to be placed upon my shoulders. So he says, I will carry the yoke. I will carry the burden of leadership. He says, because I am the commander of my army. He says, even though they were looking for him to take over and rule in their day, and many walked away from him because he didn't come and appear the way that they thought that he should appear. He didn't do the thing they thought that he should do. Many walked away from him. Some might have came back and some may, did, may not have come back. So as him as priest and commander and leader, he has power to deliver you. He has power to deliver me and to overcome all our enemies. So when the government is placed upon his shoulder, he says, I can handle it. I can take it because I am wise. I know what to do. And then it says, and his name will be called. See, the names that we call Jesus are characteristics or his attributes of his character. And it describes who he is and what he has come to do. See, when we call him Emmanuel, we're saying, Emmanuel, when we sing that song, we're saying God with us. We're invoking his presence. We're asking him to come and be with us. So when we name, even when we name our children, we have to be careful of what we name our children because the name denotes of what that child or what that person is going to become or what they're going to do in their lifetime. So be careful of what you call your children. And then it tells us his name will be called Wonderful. See, many of us receive nicknames based on our character, based on our stature or our size or something we did. And a name was given to us based on what someone else observed. With Jesus, he has been given names that give us knowledge of who he is and the role that he's going to play in your life and my life and through all eternity. So he is wonderful, which means he is marvelous. He is admirable. When you, when you think about Jesus, you 
you should become awestruck because he shows himself different every day. Not that he's changing in a bad way, but he's showing us a, another part of him, another part of his character. He's showing us how powerful he is. He's showing us how mighty he is. And he oftentimes, he don't show us everything at one time because when you're in first grade, you're not expected to be able to do sixth grade work. So he gives us bit by bit according to how we can handle it, how we can digest it, how we can understand it and understand him. So little by little, he gives it to us. In Psalms 40 verse 5, it says, Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us, towards us cannot be recounted or they cannot be told back to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. So he is so wonderful because all the works that he's done. We don't even know all the times that he has been wonderful to us. How many times he's kept us from accidents or how many times he's kept us from being poisoned. Or how many times he's kept uh, the enemy had planned to do something to us. And because God said in his, in his word, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The enemy formed the weapon, but yet it did not prosper. Hallelujah. Then Isaiah 25, 1, he says, Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Isaiah 25, 1. So they're just recounting all the things that God has done for them, how wonderful he is. And it's important you dive into his word and, and you find out what other saints have said, what he's done for other people in the Bible, what he has allowed to be penned in writing so that we can see what he's done in other people's life, how wonderful he was, all the things that he did for them, how he brought the Israelites through the Red Sea and how they passed through. And that was the biggest aquarium, aquarium that has ever been and will ever, ever be seen was when they walked through and they were able to see the fish and the whales and all that stuff on the side of them as they walking through on dry land. Then he's a counselor. He's, his name is count. He's a counselor. See a counselor on earth here is someone who is usually a professional who helps others with personal, social, or psychological problems. A professional who gives advice on such matters as careers, education, or health. Somebody that counsel could be a friend who gives advice. It could be a lawyer or someone like that, or somebody who manages cases for a client. But Jesus is a counselor, and he far exceeds what we know as an earthly counselor. He is a counselor. He counsels without self-interest, and he can sympathize with us. He is touched with our infirmities. When we go to our earthly counselor and we talk to that person, that person is only obligated to hear us for the amount of time that's allotted to us for that particular day. That's why they give you appointments on a specific day and a specific time. And that person is only interested in you during that time frame. But Jesus is always interested in us. He's always open. His doors are always open. We don't have to set a time or a date to go and talk to Jesus. We can go and talk to him at any time because he is a counselor. So how has he been a counselor to you? Has he counseled you in your marriage or your family or how you, to raise your kids or in a court case or in a support or custody case and your selection of friends or how to discuss various subjects with friends and what directions to take or not to take, what school to go to, when to leave your house or when not to leave your house, what to wear? How has he counseled you? I remember asking the Lord, I was getting dressed and I said, Lord, I said, do you like what I have on? Because I'm very particular in what I put on. I don't want to wear anything that's going to bring shame to my daddy. Just like with my kids, I would hope that my kids would be the same way, that they wouldn't wear anything that they know would be shameful to us as their parents. So I asked the Lord, do you like what I have on? And he responded to me. He said, you look simply marvelous. And I just bust out and laugh. I thought that was so, so funny. So he is a counselor. He 
cares about what we put on. He cares about how we look. He cares about how we feel. So he is a counselor. In Exodus 17, he even told Moses how to defeat their enemies. He said, just keep your hands in the air. And when Moses became weary and his arms became heavy, they pulled out a rock and had uh, Moses to sit on this rock. And as he sat on the rock, they held up Moses' hand. So God counseled them on how to defeat their enemies, how to defeat them. And then in Romans chapter 10, he instructs us on how to receive eternal life and the consequences of sin, because he tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And that's a good counselor because he's telling us, look, the wages of sin is death. If you don't receive this free gift, the wages of sin is death. The penalty that you got to pay is death. But the gift of God, see, the gift, the free gift that I'm giving you will wipe away that penalty, will satisfy that penalty. But all you've got to do is receive it. You've got to receive me as your Lord and Savior. So then in Numbers 21, he counsels Moses on what to do. The people were murmuring against God and they were murmuring and complaining against Moses. They were complaining because they were saying, well, you brought us out here in this wilderness and it's hot, and we don't have the things that we used to have back in Egypt, and all of this. It just kept complaining. So God sent snakes that bit these people, and many of them died. So Moses went to him and was talking to him. Moses and God were friends, so he was talking with him, and he told him, he says, look, this is what you're going to do. You go and make a bronze uh, snake, a bronze snake or a bronze serpent. They, they're the same, and put it on a pole. And he says, when you put it on the pole, anyone that's bitten by the snake, if they look upon this pole, they will not die. They will live. So he counseled Moses on what to do. And then he also instructed the men how to catch the fish. He said, catch your net on the side. And he said, and you will catch fish. And then he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Well, how can you make a person fishers of men by counseling them, by teaching them, by training them, by telling them what they need to do by instructing them, by showing them what they need to do. And then he tells us as a counselor, he says, look, if you do what I tell you to do, he says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the keys that I'm going to give you, whatever you bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. But You've got to follow his direction because Jesus said that him and his word are one and he will put his word in your heart. And whatever, when he puts something within you, it's going to lead God and direct you. So if you follow Jesus' instructions, you can have the things that you read about in the word, in the Bible, things that you've heard, and you can have access to these keys, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. These are the most powerful keys that you will ever own. And it's God's gift to you. See, these keys symbolize authority because your key to your house, you have the authority to go into your house. Your key to your house won't work at my house because you don't have the authority to operate my lock and to get into my house. But see, the key that Jesus has given us, it gives us authority in his name. And then it gives us power of the Holy Spirit. And then it gives us dominion over all things on earth. So he says, look, I'm giving you the most powerful keys that you can ever own. And he says, I'm giving it to you because it's in my name that you will operate. It's in my name that these keys will work. So he instructs us on how to gain access to the most powerful kingdom ever established and that speaking his name in faith, it will render demons immobile. It will cause cancer to dry up. It, it will even raise people from the dead. So he's a mighty good counselor. In Mark chapter six, It says that 
when the people heard him, they were astonished. And they wanted to know, where did this man get these things? How can this man speak like this? How does he have such wisdom? He's a mighty good speaker. He's a mighty good counselor. So how did he get these things? How is he able to do this? Because he is the word of God. He is God in the flesh. And then we go down and it says, he is the mighty God. He says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So he's letting us know that I am mighty. I'm great in strength and power. I possess might. I am powerful. I'm great in size. I am extraordinary. So he is a mighty God. Hallelujah. He is a mighty powerful God. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he lets us know that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Only an almighty God can take something old and make it new. Nobody on this earth can take something old and make it brand new. Take that same exact thing and make it brand new. They can take a coat or a piece of cloth and make it something else, but they can't ever make that brand new. Once it gets old, that's it. But God is able to take what is old and make it new. And then he says, all the old things have passed away, which means I've erased everything from your past. I've erased it. I choose not to remember those things anymore. He said, because I am the almighty God. I choose not to remember those things because if I remember those things, I will have to judge you according to those things. And then he tells us he is the everlasting father, which means he is eternal. He is never failing. He will never come to an end. He is a father. He's a protector. He's a provider. And Revelations 1.18, he says, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. In other words, I am he who lives. I was alive before I came to earth. I was alive before I created the earth and I was dead. I was buried in the tomb, but behold, I am alive. I have resurrected. I have resurrected. I am alive forevermore. And he says, amen. So be it. Nothing can, ch nobody can change what I've already spoken. Amen. So be it. The, the case is closed. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus said, he is the everlasting father. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says the eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemy from before you and said, destroy. So God is the eternal God. He is eternal. He is the everlasting father and nobody can stand up against them, not even our enemies. So if you have enemies that are coming up against you, give them to the Lord, speak his word. When he tells you to speak, speak and watch them dissipate, watch them go away, watch them come to naught, watch them be nothing no more in your life. Then in Psalm 90 verse two it says, before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So the psalmist is letting us know that you are God. You were here from the beginning and you will be here forevermore. He is the creator of all things and his kingdom will never end. Luke 1 33. So we know him as the Prince of Peace. See, Jesus came to make peace between us and God because we were doomed for eternal damnation. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity or shaped in wickedness, which means that our sin debt had to be paid and couldn't be done with the blood of animals. So Jesus had to come. So as prince, we know a prince on this earth is one that's born into a royal family of a king or a queen. It's a man who rules a principality or state or a person of high rank or a high standing in a class or profession. So Jesus is above all those things. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one that's able to, to uh, bring freedom to us, to disquiet our oppressive thoughts or emotions. He's the one that can bring harmony. He's the one that can speak calmness to our life. So whenever you're going through a depression or a state where things just keep bothering you. We have to give it to Jesus because he is a prince of peace. He said, the peace that I give you is not as a world give. 
do I give? He says, but the peace I give surpasses man's understanding. See, Jesus' peace, the peace that he gives, that even though there's turmoil going on in your life, even though there's turmoil going on in your city, you can have the peace knowing that God is still in control, knowing that nobody has kicked him off his throne, knowing that nobody has fired him, that he's still in control. Hallelujah. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is a leader. He is a gentleman. He is the Prince of Peace who is able to make peace between God and you, God and me, and to give us peace with others and ourselves. Romans 5, verse 1 and 8, 3 says, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace only comes through Jesus Christ. People in the world that have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they don't have this kind of peace that he's talking about. They think they have peace because they got money in the bank or maybe they got a big home or something like that. But you don't see them behind closed doors. You don't see them when they're crying and they're trying to figure out what what way should they turn. You don't see that when the enemy is hacking at them and they don't even know how to, how to usher out a prayer. You, we don't see those things. They put all these things on social media that looks all good. They got these big houses. And most of the time, the houses aren't even there. They're renting them for a time or they're ba using them for uh, someone. They might be a cleaner for the house. So don't believe everything that you see on social media, because if you see those things, you will start thinking bad about yourself or looking at what you have um, with a squinting eye like, why does that person have that stuff and I don't? I know I used to think that when I used to go home and I was in the Air Force and I would come home and I was like, man, these people are living large. They got all this stuff and they're not even working. And I'm going to work sometimes 12 hours, 16 hours out of a day and I don't have half of what they have. But see, a lot of things that those people were getting were gotten ill will. They did not get them legally. And I was earning everything that I had legally because I was working for what I had. So don't get caught up with what people, what you see on social media. And it says of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So there will never be an end to Jesus's kingdom, to his throne. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it. See, it was spoken of that Jesus would be, would rule the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So Jesus volunteered to come to earth to reconcile humanity back to God. He came to abolish the physical and spiritual laws and the offering of animals, the sacrifice of animals for the atonement of sin. See, the, the blood of animals did not take away the sin. It only satisfied for a short period of time. So Isaiah is telling us that Jesus was given to us. A child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder. And then he tells us what his name, what he will be called. So all of these things, I have experienced him being those things in my life. I've experienced him as being wonderful. Hallelujah. When I got into an accident in, in Myrtle Beach and it was um, a three-car collision, I experienced him as being wonderful. As a counselor, I've experienced him as a counselor when I asked what do I need to do? Do I need to stay in the military or should I get out? I had to go to him as counselor, as my counselor and seek him for myself. He is the mighty God. He kept me protected. There's times that I was beaten uh, in my first marriage. And as the mighty God, he stepped in. He kept me from losing my life. As the everlasting father, he has spoke over my life and he has given me eternal life. So I have eternal life in me. So I know that when I close my eyes on this time, I have all on this side, I have all hope knowing that I'm going to meet my father face to face, the everlasting father. And I know Jesus as the Prince of Peace because all the things that we're going through with the um, the cases that we're that we're in, the legal cases that we're in, 
all of those. I know him as a prince of peace because he's given me peace at times that I needed it, that his peace went beyond my understanding. Once I started singing praises to him, once I started thanking him for who he is, all those thoughts and those intrusive thoughts went away. So I've experienced him as these, these things, and I know that he will continue to be those things. So we know on Saturday and Sunday, you're going to be reminded that he was born. You may be reminded he was born in a manger and he was laid in a carved tree. You may be reminded that he was in the presence of animals. You may be reminded that he was born of a virgin. You may be reminded that he was born in a borrowed uh, barn. You may be reminded that wise men sought him out. You may be reminded that his uh, presence was foretold and by a star and angels in the sky announced his birth. You may be told that the sun was darkened at his death. You may be told that he was born at night. You may be told that he had gifts of spices that they brought to his to his birth to commemorate his birth. And then they brought spices to anoint his body to commemorate his death. But he's more than a carpenter. He's more than Mary's baby. He's more than that. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is a counselor. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the everlasting Father. He is a healer. He is a deliverer. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Almighty God. He is El Shaddai. He is Elohim. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord my battle. He is Jehovah Shekinu. He is Jehovah Shema. He is all of these things. He is Alpha and Omega. Hallelujah. He is everything that you could ever hope for. So whenever... It appears to you that everything is in ruin. Call, recall to your mind that Christ is wonderful because he has inconceivable methods of assisting you and because his power is far beyond what you're able to conceive. When you need him as counselor, remind yourself of his strength. Remind yourself that he is mighty and that he's strong. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So if there's any questions or comments before I bring my pastor on, you can press star six. See, exceed their needs, God, because I know that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all they ask or think. And as they celebrate your resurrection this weekend, Lord, may they keep their minds stayed on who you are, Lord, and all that you've come to declare and to be in our lives, Lord. And Father, I just thank you. Until we meet again, keep us safe from hurt, harm, and danger. Keep us healed, keep us delivered, keep us sanctified, and keep us free. In Jesus' name, God bless everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Until we meet again, if God delays his call or coming, we'll meet again next Tuesday. Same. This is the most critical part of the Bible study, of you hearing the word of God and being able to apply it to your life. This is the part where I introduce you to our Lord and Savior. So for anyone who would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is what I would like for you to pray. This is prayer for your salvation, to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Repeat these words. Lord, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose on the third day and ascended back to heaven. I know I am unable to live this life apart from you and I need the indwelling of your Holy Spirit to teach me, to guide me, and to all truth. Help me to live holy, upright, and be faithful to you. I invite you to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Glory to God. If you've prayed that prayer, 
then your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I encourage you to tune in each Tuesday to our Bible study so that you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the one who you now serve. And I welcome you into the family of God.